We are going to begin this conversation by doing a quick review of some of our key terminology uh, that we saw last semester. So let's zero in on some of this. And one of the first things that we want to talk about are the differences between solutions and colloids and suspensions. Now, for a solution, what we have is a situation that is completely homogeneous inside. So if we have a solution, it's small particles, it's uniform throughout. Now, these are the things that are going to be some of the key observable distinguishing factors. So do you see with these, with a the solution, they don't stand separate, they can't be separated by filtration, and they don't scatter light. Now, by the time you get to a colloid, we're talking about medium-sized particles. We're still at a point where they don't separate, but just on standing. They can't be filtered, but take a look. Yes, indeed, they do scatter light. So scattering light is your key distinguishing characteristic as we hop from a solution to a colloid. Now, if we evaluate those three factors again, when we get to a suspension, very large particles, visually heterogeneous, not the same throughout, they separate on standing, they can be separated by filtration, and they scatter light. So you see we can take a progression through those um, to see how we can distinguish one from another. Now, what we're going to focus on right now are homogeneous mixtures or solutions. Now, initially we're going to use this term very broadly, but very quickly we're going to use solution to mean an aqueous solution, a water-based. So let's start with the broadest terminology first. So when we talk about a solution, we use the word soluble. Soluble means capable of being dissolved, able to mix evenly in one another. Now, dissolving is typically considered a physical change. I'm going to be honest with you, with ionics, there's a little bit of ambiguity there, but for our purposes, we're going to call it a physical change. The chemical formulas don't really, they're not really altered at all. Now, there's two main components to this. We have the solvent. The solvent is the dissolving medium. It's typically the one present in the greatest amount. Unless it's water with a solid, it's always considered the water. So unless the question indicates very clearly otherwise, if water's present, it's considered the solvent. All right, solids into liquids, the liquid's typically considered the solvent. All the same phase, the one that's present in the most would be considered the solvent. The solute, is the substance being dissolved. So if I have my iced tea, the water is my solvent, and all that sugar that I like to put into it would be the solute. The sugar is what is being dissolved. So if we have salt water, and when we say that, well, let's specify it's the salt NaCl. If we have salt water, the NaCl is the solute, and the water is considered the solvent. And so if we were to write this, and you've seen this before, this is all review, which is why I can go quickly, we would call that NaCl aqueous. All right, I put in some pictures here in hopes that I would clarify this a little bit more for you. Uh, it doesn't have to be a solid dissolved into a liquid. Let's look at the four basic types. We can have a gas dissolved into a liquid. Uh, soda is something like that. The carbon dioxide, some of the gas is dissolved. But all water pretty much has oxygen dissolved in it. So I found this picture. Uh, this is for dissolved oxygen in a fish tank. 
and we would measure that in parts per million. Now, a part per million is like a percentage, right? With a percentage, you take a part over the whole and you multiply by 100. Well, if it's a part per million, you multiply by 10 to the sixth and you get your parts per million. So we would measure the dissolved oxygen in parts per million um, with this being considered very high and this being very low and it, it will not sustain life. All right, we can have a gas-gas mixture. My husband deals with these in his business. And this is just showing cylinders being filled up. And you fill up with one type of gas. Once you fill up with the other, there's a lot of turbulence as they mix. And eventually, you end up with a more uniform, once it's uniform, homogeneous solution. I'm going to use S-O-L apostrophe N a lot for solution. So we want to get used to that. Liquid in liquid, vinegar. Vinegar is acetic acid in water. So acetic acid has a carbon and a hydrogen, and a hydrogen and a hydrogen. So it's one carbon and another. Then it has this double bonded oxygen and an OH. I wanted to draw that for you so that we can start to get into our discussion of how like dissolves like. And that polar group on the acetic acid interacts with polar water and they dissolve in one another. And so that would be a liquid in a liquid. Here's a couple of examples of solid solid. This is your brass instruments, any of you who are in band. Brass is a mixture primarily of copper and zinc, although other metals are added or the percentages are varied to get the properties that you want. And this is bronze, like you would bronze baby shoes, and that's copper and tin. And again, varying different percentages. Now, when we have a solid and a solid, and this is a word you should know, so write it down in your notes, circle it. You need to know that. That's an alloy. Now, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and explicitly include the fifth. It's missing in your notes because we really alluded to it back when we talked about the NaCl example. So here's Kool-Aid. In other words, there's your sugar and your dyes and all that other mystery stuff that they put in the Kool-Aid and you would dissolve that solid into water and you get your homogeneous solution. All right, now question, does everything always dissolve in something else? No, structure determines function. So the structure is going to indicate how it functions, whether it will, something will function as a dissolving agent or not. So our words that we use, if it doesn't dissolve, it's, it's considered insoluble. It's soluble if it does dissolve and insoluble if it does not dissolve. Now, a long time ago, it seems, way back first semester, we made these columns with different densities. And I have a picture of one in just a minute. Uh, but I want to remind you of some words that we used. In our vinegar and water, because there were two liquids, these two terms deal only with liquids, two liquids that will mix together are considered to be miscible. I like to think of it as liquids that are mixable are considered miscible. And there'd be uniform throughout. There would be no interface dividing the liquids. Now, this picture here is showing you oil and water, and oil and water are immiscible. Okay, water is polar, oils are carbons and hydrogens, and those are considered nonpolar and the energetics are not favorable for them to mix. So you would start with kind of the oil suspended and then slowly but surely it would begin to separate until you can see a clear interface 
between the two immiscible liquids. All right? So, now this is an example. I found this online. This was similar to what we made at the very beginning of the year. So, immiscible liquids don't mix, they separate into layers. And if you remember, way back when, this is a review, so I'm doing it fast. The low density liquid would be on the top, and the high density, like maybe our honey here, our high density would be on the bottom. Okay? Now, there's some guidelines or rules or rules that we would follow for this of what will form solutions and what won't. So the first rule is one I've mentioned already, and that's the rule that like dissolves like. The energetics are very favorable for this, and so polar will go with polar, and we'll see polar goes with some ionic. It depends on relative strengths of attraction. Remember I've said before, life is all about attractive forces. We're about to get back into that, okay? Nonpolar dissolves nonpolar, okay? So one of the ways you can look at this is if a substance will dissolve in oil, so if it will go into oil, then that substance must be, whatever that substance is, must be nonpolar. And if the substance will dissolve in water, it must be polar covalent. So it's a way we can identify the polarity is based upon what it dissolves into. Now, uh, in order to predict it, remember, structure determines function. And so we would have to draw it. Water, if you remember way back on our Lewis dot structure, water has a permanent dipole moment. It's a little bit negative and a little bit positive. If we did the Lewis dot structure for phosphorus tribromide, okay, so let's take a look at that. The phosphorus brings five electrons, each bromide brings seven, so 21 and five is 26, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 22, 24, 26. Hopefully you remember how to do that. So because we have here this extra pair of electrons, right? We have an A, B, 3, X structure that makes this polar. And so if it's polar, it will dissolve in our polar water. Okay, let's try ammonia. I'm just gonna do a few more and then we will end this video and move on in the next video. Ammonia has five, each hydrogen has three, so that's a total of eight. And so we see that ammonia is also an AB3X, so ammonia is polar. If we look at methane, it's a carbon with four hydrogens. Meth, remember, meth eats people's brains. Meth means one carbon. And if all you have, you don't even have to draw these, if all you have are carbons and hydrogens, then you have a non-polar substance. So in this case, this is a big fat no. They would not dissolve. This one was a yes. Carbon tetrafluoride would be a carbon with four fluorines around it. We already know that water is polar. So if I'm, I'm going to do this one quick, and hopefully you can see I have the exact same thing. That's a really fast Lewis dot. I'm sorry, I'm almost out of time here. This is nonpolar covalent. 
it is not going to dissolve in water. And if you draw this one, you'd find that it's nonpolar and nonpolar, and so yes, it will dissolve. So, all right, we will pick up the conversation in our next video. So until then, this is signing off. Signing off.